My name is Sky Van Duren. I'm going to talk to you today about something that's very important to me that I think should be taken more seriously in the community of classical musicians. And I'd like to sh show you how I think it can be done. I'm talking today about improv in improvisation. I'm personally fascinated with improvising. I love the idea of creating something from nothing. And even more than that, I love the idea of doing it quickly and spontaneously. I can hardly think of something that's more natural to do, something that's more innate and universal that's shared by everyone on this planet than improvising. We all do it every day when we decide what to say to a colleague, what we're going to eat for dinner. If you've ever played a sport, that's improvising. If you've ever had something break and you had to fix it up with duct tape and Gorilla Glue, that's improvising. And listen to this, if you have a young child in your family or you have one yourself, you've watched them play. Are they following rules all the time? Of course not, they're making it up as they go. If anything, they're making up rules and changing them as they go. Children are fantastic improvisers. More pertinently to us here, it's important to music. It's vital to music. We wouldn't have music without it. We wouldn't have notation if not to write something down that had been previously improvised. We wouldn't have pieces to play if not for composers improvising at the piano on their instrument or just in their head, and they're writing down their ideas. But for whatever reason, with few exceptions, classical musicians are pretty notoriously resistant to the idea of improvising. We want everything we do to be perfect. The music has to be just right. Am I right? Otherwise, you're not going to win the audition. You're not going to get the gig. And in my estimation, I think brass players are some of the worst at this. Orchestral musicians at large are some of the worst at this. Now, obviously, jazz is a huge topic. And you could get advanced degrees in jazz from this and this school and many other schools. But to be honest, there isn't all that much material for teaching improvisation to classical musicians of other styles. Part of the reason for that is, as I see it, teachers tend to be either of the opinion that it can't be taught, throw that one out, forget it, or that it has to be learned by doing. So they'll throw you in the deep end and see what happens. I don't share that opinion. I think some preparation and fundamental training is really important for students to feel confident getting started improvising. Otherwise, they just won't do it. And it isn't that hard to get started. It just takes a methodical approach. I can hardly hope to do this topic justice in an hour, but I do want to give you some tools and some ideas that you might be able to use. So I'm proposing a three-step process for you and or your students to break the ice and become an improviser. First, I want to convince you why it's something worth caring about. It's hard to imagine music ever developing except from improvisation. It certainly didn't begin with someone writing something down and someone else playing it, right? Most musical cultures around the world came about through improvisation and are still practiced that way. In Western classical music, really, we're the exception to have such a robust, notated tradition. Even in Western popular music, that's not really the case anymore. It's mostly an oral art form. In Indian classical music, improvisation is the norm. You may have heard of the raga and the tala that organize pitch and time, the raga being the palette for choosing pitches, and the tala is the framework for improvising rhythmically. Drumming circles of Western Africa are improvisational experiences where musical skill isn't even a prerequisite. Everyone in the circle is considered to be at the same level and makes the music spontaneously together. Native American flute playing is another example, totally improvised within the scale available on that instrument. You get the idea, I'm sure I don't need to go on. Now, of course, certain types of Western classical musicians can and do improvise. Organists, early musicians, right? Occasionally, you'll see someone improvise a cadenza or something like that. We improvise when we add ornaments to Baroque music. We know Mozart was an impro improviser at the piano, Beethoven too. Bach was a spectacular improviser, and he was known for it. Most composers will improvise when they're just coming up with ideas. And it's not just old news. Now you have hard rock, blues, heavy metal. The guitar is an instrument that is extremely conducive for improvising. It's part of the basic training for almost every guitarist. Rappers come up with rhymes on the fly when they're freestyling. Electronic musicians and DJs dial those knobs and get just the right sound and then modulate it on the fly. So this is something we still have an evolving tradition of even today. And if that's not enough for you, you'll definitely get something out of it for your own trouble. 
technical facility. You get better chops by working on this stuff. It's not a requirement to be virtuosic to improvise. Actually, it's the opposite. But it will make you want to get better. If you're not an improviser, not yet an improviser, then take it from me. You can never feel the, the limits of your own technique more acutely than when you want to say something through your instrument and you can't. It's like something, a word that's on the tip of your tongue and you just can't quite articulate. It's maddening. So you work on it. And the act of trying to play a lick, fumbling through it, not quite getting it, trying again, eventually getting it, that is learning in real time. Not to mention getting out of that sheet music that you've been staring at for years, myself included, and having to conjure something from within is a demand of its own. It opens up neural pathways from brain to fingertips that you may not have used in a while. Self-efficacy, confidence. You learn to believe in yourself. You don't need no sheet music. You don't need to hide behind a stand. It's your show. Your ideas are on display. You come to believe your ideas are worth being on display. It works on younger students too. Patrick Davison in his PhD dissertation at the University of North Texas found that band students scores in self-efficacy went up, way up, after basic improvisation training. And it works for singers too, as demonstrated in a study by David Hershorn. I'll have more information at the end. Creativity, it almost speaks for itself, right? But really, what I've noticed through coaching my ensemble and in myself is once it sinks in that you're the composer and the performer, that you're producing from scratch instead of reproducing, and you're not being judged, you start to take chances. You take risks. You get out of your comfort zone. You explore. You play like a child on a playground. We play our instruments all the time, but how often are we playing with our instruments? Right? The freedom to play is seriously important for creativity. Listening skills. Now this one might be less obvious because what are you listening for when you're improvising? Well, really you're listening for everything. Improvisation opens up other avenues you don't usually listen for, like timbre, like noise. You don't have to make the same sound you usually do. Maybe you want to make a strident sound. Maybe you want to make a heavy, dark sound. It depends on what everyone else is doing. It's the same way a chef tastes for what the dish needs. Does it need more salt, more acid? It's up to you. Performance anxiety. And this one you may not have seen coming either. I didn't. But in a way, it's also a no-brainer if you think about it. If you're not being judged on how well you reproduce something that's already there, what's there to be anxious about? And it actually doesn't end there. Improvisation has even been found to reduce performance anxiety in non-improvised performances in piano students in a study by Robert Gale Allen, Jr. That feels significant to me. That feels like a big deal. So now I want to get into how we can learn to do it and how we can help our students to do it. And before we even play a note, we start by establishing some ideas. Because of the ubiquity of improvisation and as many discrete traditions as there are, it's necessary to begin with a discussion of what we're going for here. My goal of teaching imp improvisation is defined by freedom. That's why I, I call it free improvisation, although it really should be just called improvisation. In particular, I drew a lot of inspiration from the writings and recordings of people who were involved in the free improv movement of the 60s and 70s in the USA and Europe, precisely because those people deliberately kept away from prearranged forms, tonal center, rhythmic content, and so on. But even that music has a sound to me. So I hesitate to ascribe too much importance to that sound, to that group, or any one group, precisely because my mission is to promote the freedom to create something from nothing, from nothing, because that gives the performer the most autonomy and agency. So really, a better question might be, what are we not going for here? Not to beat a dead horse, but in music school, if you ask someone whether they improvise, what are they probably going to think of first? They might think, oh, sure, I've played over changes before, or yeah, I used to play in a jazz band, right? And their mind goes to a certain sound, a certain set of rules, group of people, and so on. And to make matters more complicated, jazz is definitely an important influence in the free improv movement. We know that players, some players, 
who played straight ahead jazz were also very successful in free improv. So it's not like there isn't crosstalk between the two. But I bring this up because working with a sound concept in mind is limiting. You're not creating from nothing. You're creating with a head start. Do you want to do that? Maybe you do, maybe you don't. Jazz is important and valid, obviously, but it's just one of many ways to improvise. And I do think some students are intimidated when they think about jazz. There's so much to learn. I'll never sound like Charlie Park. I'll never sound like Clifford Brown. So why would I even start, right? And obviously, that's antithetical to the point here. And I mentioned earlier the types of classical improvisation you might hear, but the very nature of our art, of that art, is one of careful reproduction. And that is what makes it so great. That's why we're doing it. That's why I'm doing it. And of course, I'm not campaigning against it. This is just a different art that I think we ought to be conversing in. I'm also here to tell you, it doesn't have to be unpleasant, noisy, harsh, acerbic, or any of those things. Because I think it gets a bad rap, am I wrong? Now sure, some of these recordings are on the aggressive end of the spectrum. But some of my favorite improvisers make music that is easy to follow and easy to listen to. But it's rich and it's free-flowing in a way that only improvising can create. So we have defined free improvisation, or maybe just improvisation, by what it is not, at least not necessarily. If words begin to fail us to define what it is, music might help. Now, regrettably, I wish I had time to play a little bit of everything to do these albums justice, but I'm just going to refer you to them for now. So I recommend listening to some landmark recordings by pioneer musicians. This first one is Lenny Tristano Intuition. This has been called the birth of free jazz before it was called that. The legend goes, at the end of a regular old straight ahead jazz recording session, Lenny Tristano told his guys to just play. And this was the result. And Lenny himself was at the piano. Ornette Coleman, Free Jazz, there you have it in the name itself. This album is basically credited with coining the name of the free jazz movement. Anthony Braxton, for alto. I love this one. What this guy can do with an instrument is miraculous. And really, in a nutshell, embodies the kind of exploration and pushing of boundaries that I was after. Spontaneous Music Ensemble, AMM, these two were on the list because they made a splash when they came out, and they're a fairly representative look at what free improv looked like in the late 60s. And finally, Evan Parker, featuring Evan Parker and Anthony Braxton. Any of this man's records are worth a listening for context. He usually likes to play solo, actually. Sometimes circular breathing and playing sweeping lines back and forth across the registers of his saxophone, creating an illusion of polyphony. It's fascinating stuff. If you like a list of these albums and more, just email me. I'm happy to share what I found. Now let's talk about some important concepts to get you or your student in the right headspace for improvising. This section is largely inspired by an excellent book by Luis Alejandro Olarte, Elements of Electroacoustic Music, Improvisation, and Performance. Trust and respect. Like I have said, improvisation is not an art of reproduction, and we are not judged by our ability to match a predefined goal. Instead, it comes from within us. And at its best, it's a musical expression of our most immediate thoughts. And thus, it can be a fairly vulnerable and revealing act. We have to have some sort of agreement to commit to an artistic endeavor, which at times involves vulnerability and risk. We should support each other, trust in each other to act with the best intentions, and respect everyone's musical voice. Tolerance and forbearance, meaning we give each other the space for transgression of role and expectation. We allow the musical expression to take unexpected turns based on the group mentality. Be willing to take a step back. Be willing to take a step forward. Be willing to concede and be willing to offend. Political correctness and staying in your lane can be an obstacle, resulting in staying in your comfort zone the whole time and ultimately lifeless music. Again, trust in each other to act with the best of intentions, not to be the hero of the story, but to collaborate on an artistic product together. Action and inaction, constantly demanding attention 
and total non-participation are both to be avoided. But one has to be aware of the danger of staying in the absolute middle, the tepid waters of comfort, as Olarte puts it, by never taking any risks. Each performance is its own sound world and needn't resemble any other performance nor avoid resembling any other performance. Respect all sounds. One of my mantras is, all sounds are valid. All ideas are valid. You can play conventionally, striving for a conventionally good sound, but I invite you not to. I invite you to explore. Good and bad, right and wrong, these are dangerous words. There certainly are no wrong notes in improv. I would even hesitate to say there are mistakes in improv. OK, elements. And I like to call these parameters, too, because they're changeable. These are not the tools, per se, but these are the dimensions, if you like, of the canvas that you're painting together. Pitch. So I think pitch is one of the most important because pitch is so highly complex. It's such a highly developed language, especially in classical music, that tends to go a long way in telling us what kind of music we're listening to. right? And we're always thinking about notes. That note was beautiful. That chord sounded great. What was that high note the trumpet player played just now? Right? So when you start improvising, a wall that you might hit is, what notes do I play? Indeed, what notes do you play? It's a fair question. And does it matter? Not to give a cop-out answer, but it matters if you wanted to. So what do you do if it does matter? We'll look at that in a moment. Same thing with rhythm. Although in my experience, rhythm tends to be a little less complex than pitch, and people have less trouble with the rhythmic aspect. By the way, I'm sorry, Dr. Sam. I see he's not here right now, so I think I'm safe. Rhythm and meter is his area of research. So I'm going to leave that there. Timbre. So I mentioned timbre is something we can now modulate freely. As brass players, we work so hard to get a big, beautiful sound, right? And then improvisation comes along and tells us we don't really need it. Or at least it's just one acceptable color. Again, all sounds are valid. A bad sound for a brass player might be just the thing the present moment needs. It's up to you to explore and find the sound you want to use at any given moment. Texture is a term I use loosely. It refers mainly to the collaborative texture created by a group, whether it's homophonic, heterophonic, polyphonic, all the usual suspects or the quality of that texture, as in dense, thin, wispy, broad, heavy, sparkling, right? And all these ideas can be used as inspiration as well. Silence. I know silence is a bit of a cliche at this point, and Debussy apparently said, music is the space in between the notes. I wouldn't go that far. I think music is the music. But I do think silence is more important than we think. During coaching, I would tell my guys, don't play all the time. Don't be afraid to drop out for a while. Don't be afraid to step back. Because silence articulates music in the same way it does speech. It gives you a chance to catch up. It gives the listeners something else to focus on. That also changes the texture, of course. And we need that. And above all, silence usually means we're listening. And form. Why not? Improvisation doesn't have to be formless, aimless, chaotic. It doesn't. I really believe in form, even when the content is absolutely unpredictable. I recently heard a poet say on the radio, energy quickly leaks out of an ill-formed work of art. Beautiful. I totally agree. And although my mission is giving the performer complete agency, the potentially paralyzing burden of infinite choice it, that's not lost on me. I understand that, right? So sometimes it helps to say, here, do whatever you want, but go in this direction, OK? And occasionally, you might find they do do whatever they want, but they go in a different direction. And that's fine, too. By now, I think we're probably all on the same page about what improv is. But at this point, a lot of teachers would say, OK, go. And this is where I diverge. This is where I want to offer something concrete to counter all the highfalutin ideas I just threw at you. So you have a handout, or if you don't, feel free to take out your phone. I promise I won't get mad at you. And go to the link on the screen here. 
And these are what I call stepping stones exercises. This is what I came up with. They're so-called because they're designed to take something you know and build from it in a slow, methodical, and progressive way until you're improvising and you don't even know it. That's the goal. That's the ideal. But I think at least with my group, it really did pan out. So these are meant to take a total beginner and go basically from square one. They do assume some level of skill on the instrument. So these could be used roughly with at least high school to undergrad level students, let's say. For younger kids, you might need to spend more time on the basics. Let's go, th let's go through some of these stepping stones. All right. So the burden of choice thing I mentioned, right? Especially with, with pitch. What notes do I play? This is what we do about it. Limit yourself, the two of you or your group, to one musical parameter. I'm going to invite my friend Emery up for our first performance. So my very first stepping stone is called serpentine scales. You're just playing a scale, any scale, and the only choices you have to make are when to turn around and when to stop. If you like, you can play off the other person, copy what they're doing, or contrast what they're doing. Create a texture together. Pick a scale. We're going to build on that now by adding a variation. So the variation for now is we're going to add skips, occasional skips to any other note in the scale, and change up the rhythm so that we're not just playing more of the same, pretty much the same note every time, but that we can do whatever rhythms we want, but it's still mostly in stepwise motion. And that's basically step one. That's the jumping off point. It takes something that pretty much everyone will know from high school and above and builds on it. So now, there we go, expanding improvisational choices. Many of my stepping stones have variations like that on them that allow you to make more choices at a time. And that from one exercise to the next, roughly, they begin to give you more choices and ask more of you so that you're developing all the technique you need to say what you want to say one step at a time. And for the sake of time, we'll, we'll move on to the next one, which is call and response, or aural modeling. Now it is Taylor's turn to join me on stage for the next performance. Whether the teacher is a more experienced improviser than the student or if they're on the same page, in either case, it can be instructive to assign a role of leader and follower to each. This is the introduction of roles to the improvisation setting. It's also a valuable ear training exercise and challenges the follower to do what the leader does, but always in such a way as to make an interesting texture. So this one is called copycat. Taylor will be copying me, and then we'll switch.
uh, Taylor's going to be the leader, and I'll copy him. All right. Now, most of this talk could apply to pretty much any instrument, but since most of us are brass players, and that's the world that I live in, I do want to acknowledge some aspects of brass playing and how they interface with free improvisation. Obviously, we don't have unlimited stamina. We do have to take breaks. But when you're improvising, and when you're improvising, you're in charge of managing that. The composer didn't do it for you because you're the composer. So the advice is, don't do too much too soon. Don't go too far and stop before you think you need to. If you're going to go up for some high notes, make sure you have the chops for it. And don't be a hero. And I'm serious about this, because many of us know people who got injured, or almost got injured because they went way beyond their limits. I'm one of those people. I struggle with that myself, and it's no joke. All right? so take care of yourself. Missing notes. Another thing brass players are always worried about, right? And I bet you can guess what I'm going to say about this. There are no missed notes, OK? We're working in a medium that is additive, not subtractive. So you're not going to lose points if you miss a note. You've just created a different note from the one you intended. And that adds something to the artistic product in nearly the same way. It sounds euphemistic, but it's true. OK, I've touched on this point already, right, tone production. You've learned to make a great sound on your instrument. You can use that sound, or you could use one of many other sounds. In this kind of music, your sound is an element you can modulate. And it's so worth taking the time to explore your instrument in other ways. To use the chef analogy again, this is like a chef exploring what ingredients are out there that they can make the most of. So know your ingredients and extended techniques. You have a handout for this as well. If not, you can check it out from the link on the screen. And I would love to say that this list is exhaustive because I did my best to make it so. But my guys have already proven me wrong in rehearsals. I think it might be impossible to list all the ways a brass instrument can make sound or to change the sound of a brass instrument. So now I'm going to invite Emery and Evan up to the stage and demonstrate for you. And by the way, as far as I'm concerned, extended techniques can include not playing your instrument. One of my stepping stones is called sidearm. And what that refers to is another instrument, and it doesn't have to be a musical instrument. Anything that can make noise or modulate the noise of something else. I asked my ensemble to bring a sidearm with them to rehearsals and for today. Once again, the mantra, all sounds are valid. Now for a duet that features extended techniques, of any kind, and how they do it is up to them.
Okay, now that we've gone over some of the basics, we can get to performing. Solo playing is really an interesting format on its own. It's in this modality that one can really say what they want to say and show their artistic spirit to the world unencumbered by anything else. It's not for nothing that a lot of experienced improvisers do play solo and have done amazing work doing so. This, however, is probably the most challenging thing for a young improviser uh, to learn to do so, it's probably not the first thing they will do. Playing with a like instrument is probably the most natural way to start out. And if you're a private lesson teacher, that will probably be the mode you end up in. You can take each other's leads, mimic each other quite well, contrast when you like, or create a blend of the two sounds. In contrast, playing with a, a polyphonic instrument might suggest a role dynamic of soloist and accompaniment because this is sort of how we're used to interacting with a pianist, for example. And note that like everything else in improv, it doesn't have to be that way. You're both soloists. The trumpet player, the horn player, the trombone player, whatever it is, can accompany the pianist just as much as vice versa. Now, I have the pleasure of featuring, featuring two of my colleagues, Jonathan and Adam, you guys, yeah, who will play a completely improvised duet. And I haven't asked them to do anything in particular, so anything goes. Their instruments are, of course, more similar than not, so this performance would fall into the first category of like instruments.
All right, when you get to the point of playing with an ensemble of three or more, it can help at least at first to have some guidance for the direction the group is going to go in, whether it's having a leader or setting the intention beforehand. I would definitely recommend this for beginning groups. So what I mean by setting the intention, it can simply mean deciding roughly how long you're going to improvise for, which can be a nice way of organizing your time. It can also mean agreeing on an inspiration to follow or a prompt to use. Sometimes it means let's just play. All right, so John Stevens, Search and Reflect, and Jeffrey Agrell, Improvisation Games. These are excellent books full of prompts for improvisation. The Stevens is a, serious, a, a little more serious, a little more artsy, and the Agrell is more about having fun and it being a learning experience. Mr. Agrell, in particular, has been educating about improvising for years, and he has a whole series of these improvisation games books that I highly recommend. He's currently the professor of horn at the University of Iowa. And so to demonstrate, I'm going to ask everyone in my ensemble to come up to perform one of Mr. Agrell's exercises for a group, which is called freeform conducting. Essentially, we're being conducted without any sheet music, and it's our job to interpret what the conductor does. We're going to start with me conducting, and then who knows? Approaching the end, but don't get too comfy. <clears throat> All right, prompts based on images and inspirations. To me, this is halfway between prose and a true visual prompt. This can mean anything from deciding upon some adjectives to use for the piece, 
or even part of the piece, or deciding upon some inspirations. You might want to improvise on the changing of the seasons, the way that your favorite restaurant smells when you walk in the door, or the emotion you have when you finish your lecture recital. Or, of course, something less pleasant. You could improvise on a tragic event. You can play your sorrow, your grief, your rage. A symphony of emotions, perhaps? So visual prompts are one of the most exciting aspects of improvisation to me, when you combine the scene with the herd. So language music by Anthony Braxton is, is best known as the system that is the graphical basis for his 1969 recording for alto, the one I mentioned a few slides ago, among other pieces. And it comprises 12 types of gestures in written form that can be interpreted quite freely by the improviser. Each gesture is typically explored quite thoroughly before moving on to the next. Cobra by John Zorn, completed in 1984, is a fairly well-known improvisation game. The basic idea is there are players and a conductor or a prompter who tells the players what to do with symbols written on cue cards that look like this. You can imagine the possibilities for many similar games or pieces like this. It's endless, and to me, that makes it endlessly fascinating. And visual art or anything else. You can improvise on anything you see. And at this point, I'm going to ask for the finished piece of art from my volunteer. And we will be improvising a piece based on that artwork. And I'm going to need my whole crew again for this one. So come on up. And would one of you mind collecting the sketchbook from the gentleman there? That's fine, too. How this is done is, of course, up to the improviser. You can read the page somewhat literally, turning the lines or shapes on the paper into musical lines that are a clear representation of the physical work. You can also read the art much more figuratively and play how you feel about it, or come up with another way entirely to represent the art. The point is to use the art as a basis for improvisation. Thank you.
thank you, audience member, for our, for our visual art. You guys can stick around, and we are going to be done pretty soon. Lastly, completely free improvisation in an ensemble setting. This will be our final performance in a moment. Now we have essentially reached our destination, improvising from nothing. It's in these moments that I feel the most interesting things can happen. It's one thing to do exercises, etudes, or to be guided by a conductor, prompter, cue cards, etc. It's quite another thing to go out on stage and have no idea what you're about to do. And we don't. We haven't discussed what we were going to do for this last performance, except that it's totally free and we'll go for about 10 minutes. In a way, that can be scary. And in another way, that can be exhilarating. Is this really the destination, though, I wonder? Maybe you can come up with something even more exciting. It really is limited only by your imagination. I hope you've enjoyed this look at what is essentially a very niche way of making music, although I don't think it has to be. I have these fantasies of a musical world in which everyone can improvise and jam sessions, break out after rehearsals and concerts. So if I've piqued your curiosity even in the least, I encourage you to seek out works by some of the artists I mentioned. And next time you play your instrument, to try making something from nothing. And it doesn't even matter what it is or if you think it's any good because all sounds are valid. Thank you for coming along on this ride with me. Thank you for listening. We will conclude with a free improvisation.
I want to commend and thank my ensemble for their good faith 
and diligence, their open-mindedness, and their artistry. I owe them a debt of gratitude, so please, once more for the band. Thank you.